Spaghetti Pig Out by Paul Jennings. Guts Garvey was a real mean kid. He made my life miserable. I don't know why he didn't like me. I hadn't done anything to him. Not a thing. He wouldn't let any of the other kids hang around with me. I was on my own. Anyone in school who spoke to me was in his bad books. I wandered around the yard at lunchtime like a dead leaf blown in the wind. I tried everything. I even gave him my pocket money one week. He just bought a block of chocolate from the canteen and ate it in front of me, without even giving me a bit. What a rat. After school, I only had one friend, my cat. Bad smell. She was called that because now and then she would make a bad smell. She couldn't help it. Everyone has their faults. She was a terrific cat, but still. A cat is not enough. You need other kids for friends too. Even after school, no one would come near me. I only had one thing to do. Watch TV. But that wasn't much good either. There were only little kids shows on before tea. I wish we had a video, I said to Mum one night. We can't afford it, Matthew, said Mum. Anyway, you watch too much television as it is. Why don't you go and do something with a friend? I didn't say anything. Couldn't tell her I didn't have any friends. And never would as long as Guts Garvey was around. A bit later, Dad came in. He had a large parcel under his arm. What have you got, Dad? Oh, it's something good, he answered. Put the package on the lounge room floor. And I started to unwrap it. It was about the sides of a large cake. It was green and spongy with an opening on the front. Oh, what is it? What you've always wanted. A video player. I looked at it again. I've never seen a video player like this before. It looks more like a mouldy loaf of bread with a hole in the front. Ugh, where did you get it? Asked Mum in a dangerous voice. And how much was it? Oh, I bought it off a bloke at the pub. Real bargain, only $50. $50 is cheap for a video, I said. But is it a video? It doesn't look like one to me. Where are the cables? Oh, I said it doesn't need cables. You just put in the video and press this. He handed me a green thing that looked like a bar of chocolate with a couple of licorice blocks stuck at the top. You're joking, I said. That's not a remote. How much did you have to drink, said Mum. You must have been crazy to pay good money for that junk. She went off into the kitchen. I could tell she was in a bad mood. Well, at least try it, said Dad sadly. He handed me a video that he'd hired from down the street. It was called Revenge of the Robots. I pushed the video into the mushy hole and switched on the TV set. Nothing happened. I looked at the licorice blocks on the green chocolate thing. <laughs> it's worth a try. I pushed one of the black squares. The movie started playing at once. It works, I yelled. Good on you. Good on your dad, it worked. What a ripper. Mum came in and smiled. Well, what do you know, she said. Who would have thought that funny looking thing really was a video set? What will they think of next? Dad went out and helped Mum get tea while I sat down and watched the movie. Tried out all the licorice like buttons on the remote control. One was for fast forward, another was for pause, another for rewind. The rewind was good. You could watch all the people doing things backwards. I was wrapped to have a video. But, to tell the truth, the movie was a bit boring. I started to fiddle around with the handset. I pointed it at things in the room and pressed the buttons. I pretended it was a ray gun. Tea time, said Mum, after a while. What are we having? I yelled. Spaghetti, said Mum. Put the video on pause and went to the door. I was just about to say, I'm not hungry, when I noticed something. Bad smell was sitting, staring at the TV in a funny way. Couldn't figure out what it was at first, but I could see something was wrong. She was so still. I'd never seen a cat so still before. Her tail didn't swish. Her eyes didn't blink. She just sat there like a statue. Took off my thong and threw it over near her. Didn't move. Not one bit. Not one whisker. Dad, I yelled. Something wrong with bad smell. Came into the lounge and looked at the poor cat. It sat there staring up at the screen with glassy eyes. Dad waved his hands in front of her face. Nothing. Not a blink. She's dead, said Dad. Oh no, I cried. Not bad smell, not her. She can't be. My only friend. I picked her up. She stayed in the sitting position. Put her back on the floor. No change. She sat there stiffly. I felt for a pulse, but I couldn't find one. Her chest wasn't moving. She wasn't breathing. Hmm, something's not quite right, said Dad. I can't figure out what it is. 
She shouldn't be sitting up, I yelled. Dead cats don't sit up, they fall over with their legs pointed up. Dad picked up bad smell and felt her all over. It's no good, Matthew, she said. She's gone. We'll bury her in the garden after tea. He patted me on the head and went into the kitchen. Tears came into my eyes. I hugged bad smell to my chest. She wasn't stiff. Dead cats should be stiff. I remembered a dead cat that I once saw on a footpath. I picked it up by the tail and it hadn't bent. It had been like picking up a saucepan by the handle. Bad smell felt soft, like a toy doll, not stiff and hard like the cat on the footpath. Suddenly I had an idea. I don't know what gave it to me. It just sort of popped into my head. I picked up the funny looking remote control, pointed it at bad smell and pressed the forward button. The cat blinked, stretched and stood up. I pressed pause again. She froze, a statue again. But this time she was standing up. I couldn't believe it. I rubbed my eyes. The pause button was working on my cat. I pressed forward a second time and off she went walking into the kitchen as if nothing had happened. Dad's voice boomed out from the kitchen. Look, bad smell is alive! I picked her up and examined her. She must have been in a coma. Just as well we didn't bury her. Dad had a big smile on his face. He put bad smell down and shook his head. I went back into the lounge. I hit the licorice like buttons. None of them had anything written on them, but by now I knew kind of what each of them did. Or I thought I did. The movie started up again. I watched it for a while until a blowfly started buzzing around and annoying me. I pointed the handset at it just for fun and pressed fast forward. The fly vanished, or that's what seemed to happen. It was gone from sight, but I could still hear it. The noise was tremendous. It was like a tiny jet fighter screaming around the room. I saw something flash by and whip past me again. And again, and again. The blowfly was going so fast I couldn't see it. I pushed the pause button and pointed it up where the noise was coming from. The fly must have gone right through the beam because it suddenly appeared out of nowhere. It hung silently in mid-air, still solidified. A floating, frozen fly. I pointed the handset at it again and pressed forward. The blowfly came to life at once. It buzzed around the room at its normal speed. Come on, yelled Mum, your tea's ready. I wasn't interested in tea wasn't interested in anything except this fantastic remote control. Seemed to be able to make animals and insects freeze or go fast forward. Looked through the kitchen door at Dad. He'd already started eating. Long pieces of spaghetti dangled from his mouth. He was chewing and sucking at the same time. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Dad. Always have. He's a terrific bloke. But the one thing he used to do that really bugged me was the way he ate spaghetti. He made a lot of slurping noises and the meat sauce gathered around his lips as he sucked. He used to get on my nerves. I think that's why I did what I did. I know it's a weak excuse. I shivered. Then I pointed the control at him, and I hit the pause button. Dad stopped eating. He turned rock solid and just sat there with a the fork halfway up to his lips. His mouth was wide open. His eyes stared. The spaghetti hung from his fork like worms of concrete. He didn't blink. He didn't move. He was as stiff as a tree trunk. Mum looked at him and laughed. Oh, good one, she said. You'd do anything for a laugh, Arthur. Dad didn't move. Okay, said Mum. That's enough. You're setting a bad example for Matthew by falling around with your food like that. My frozen father never so much as moved an eyeball. Mum gave him a friendly push on the shoulder, and he started to topple. Over he went. He just looked like a statue that had been pushed off its mount. Crash! He lay on the ground, his hand still halfway up to his mouth. The solid spaghetti hung in the same position. Only now it stretched out sideways pointing at his toes. Mum gave a little scream and rushed over to him. Quick as a flash, I pointed the remote control at him and pressed forward. The spaghetti dangled downwards. Dad sat up and rubbed his head. Oh, what happened? he asked. Mm, you, you had a little turn, said Mum in a worried voice. You had better go straight down to the hospital and have a checkup. I'll get the car. Matthew, you stay here and finish your tea. We won't be long. I was going to tell them about the remote control. But something made me stop. I had a thought. If I told them about it, they'd take it off me. It was the last I would see of it for sure. If I kept it to myself, I could take it to school. Oh, I could show Guts Garvey my fantastic new find. He would have to make friends with me now that I had something good as this. Every kid in school would want to have a go. Dad and Mum came home after about two hours. 
Dad went straight to bed. The doctor had told him to have a few days rest. He said Dad had been working too hard. I took the remote control to bed with me. I didn't want to use it until the next day. It was Saturday. I slept in. I did my usual morning jobs and set out to find Guts Garvey. He usually hung around the shops on Saturday with his tough mates. The shopping centre was crowded. As I went, I looked in the shop windows. In a small cafe, I noticed a man and a woman having lunch. They were sitting at a table close to the window. I could see everything that they were eating. The man was having a steak and what was left of a runny egg. He had almost finished his meat. Reminded me of Dad and the spaghetti. I took out the remote control and looked at it. I knew I could do pause, fast forward, forward. There was one more button. I couldn't remember what this last button was for. I pushed it. I wouldn't have done it on purpose. I didn't really realise that I was pointing at the man in the shop. Poor thing. The last button was rewind. Straight away he began to uneat his meal. He went backwards, put his fork up into his mouth and started taking out the food and placing it back on his plate. The runny egg came out of his mouth with bits of steak and chips in it. In, out, in, out went his fork, each time bringing a bit of food out of his mouth. He moved the mashed up bits backwards on his plate and the knife and fork and they all formed into solid chips, steak and eggs. It was unbelievable. He was unchewing his food and uneating his meal. Before I could gather my wits, his whole meal was back on his plate. Then he put his clean knife and fork down on the table. My head swirled. Suddenly I knew I had to do. I pressed forward. Straight away, he picked up his knife and fork and began to eat his meal for the second time. The woman sitting opposite him had pushed her fist up into her mouth. She was terrified. She didn't know what was going on. Suddenly she screamed and ran out of the cafe. The man didn't take any notice. He just kept eating. He had to eat the whole meal again before he could stop. I ran down the street feeling as guilty as sin. This thing was powerful. It could make people do things backwards. Stopped at the corner. There, talking to his mean mate rabbit, was Guts Garvey. This was my big chance to get into his good books. Hey look, I said. Take a squiz at this. I held out the remote control. Guts Garvey grabbed it from my hand. Yuck, he growled. Green chocolate. Buzz off, bird brain. He lifted up the remote control. Who's going to throw it at me? No, no, I yelled. It's a remote control from a video. You just press the black things. Guts Garvey looked at me. Then he looked at the control. He didn't believe me, but he pressed one of the buttons. Rabbit was bouncing a basketball up and down the footpath. He suddenly froze. So did the ball. Rabbit stood there on one leg, and the ball floated without moving. Halfway between his hand and the ground, Guts Garvey's mouth dropped. He rubbed his eyes and looked again. The statue of Rabbit was still there. Press forward, I said, pointing to the top button. Guts pressed the control again, and Rabbit finished bouncing the ball. I smiled. I could see Guts was impressed. He turned and looked at me. Then he pointed the remote control straight at my face. No, I screamed, no! It was too late. Guts Garvey pressed the button. He paused me. I couldn't move. I just stood there, both arms frozen up in the air. My eyes stared. They didn't move. Nothing moved. I was rock solid. Guts and Rabbit laughed. Then they ran off. People gathered round. At first they laughed. A whole circle of kids and adults looking at the stupid dill, standing there like a statue. Someone waved their hand in front of my face. A girl poked me. Oh, he's good, said someone. He's not moving a muscle. I tried to speak. My mouth wouldn't move. My tongue wouldn't budge. The crowd got bigger. I felt like an idiot. What a fool. Dozens of people were staring at me, wondering why I was standing there posed like a picture on the wall. Then I stopped feeling stupid. I felt scared. What if I stay like this forever? Not breathing, not moving. Not alive, not dead. What would they do with me? Put me in the garden like a garden gnome? Stash me away in a museum? Bury me alive? Oh, it's too terrible to think about. Suddenly I collapsed. I puddled into the ground. Everyone laughed. I stood up and ran as fast as I could go. As I ran, I tried to figure it out. Why had I suddenly gone off pause? Then I realised what it was. I remembered Uncle Frank's video. If you put it on pause and went away, it would start up again, automatically, after, you know, three or four minutes. The movie would come off pause and keep going. That's what must have happened to me. I looked ahead. I could just make out two tiny figures in the distance. It was Rabbit and Guts Garvey, with my remote control. I had to get it back. The dirty rats had nicked it. I didn't care about getting in Guts Garvey's good books anymore.
I just wanted my controller back and revenge. I wanted revenge. I ran like a mad thing after them. It was no good. I was out of breath and they were too far away. I couldn't catch them. I looked around. Oh, Sean Potter, a kid from school, he was sitting on his horse, star, on the side of the road. I rushed over to him. Hey, help! You've got to help! Guts Garvey has pinched my remote control. I've got to get it back. It's a matter of life and death. Sean just looked at me. He wasn't a bad sort of kid. He was one of the few people at school who had been kind to me. He wasn't exactly a friend. He was too scared of Guts Garvey for that. But I could tell by the way he smiled and nodded at me that he liked me. I, I jumped from foot to foot. I was beside myself. I just had to get the remote control back. Sean hesitated for a second or two. Then he said, Okay, hop up. I put one foot on the stirrup. Sean pulled me up behind him onto Star's back. They went that way, I yelled. Star went into a trot, then a canter. I held on for grim death. I'd never been on a horse before. I bumped up and down behind Sean. The ground seemed a long way down. I was scared, but I didn't say anything. I just had to catch Guts, Garvey and Rabbit. We sped down the street past all the parked cars and people crossing the road. There they are, I yelled. Guts and Rabbit were in a line of people waiting for a bus. Sean slowed Star down to a walk. Guts Garvey looked up and saw us. He pulled the remote from his pocket. Oh no, not that! I don't know whether or not Star sensed danger. Anyway, he did what horses often do at such times. He lifted up his tail and let a large streaming flow of horse droppings fall onto the ground. Then he took a few steps towards Guts in the line of people. Guts pointed the remote control at us and hit the rewind button. Stop! I screamed, but it was too late. Star began going into reverse. She walked up a few steps backwards. A pile of horse droppings began to stir. It twisted and lifted, then it flew through the air, back to where it came from. A line of people roared. Some laughed. Some screamed. Some ran off. How embarrassing. I was filled with shame. Poor Star went into a backwards trot. Then suddenly she froze. We all froze. Guts had hit the pause button. He had turned Sean, Star and me into statues. While we were standing there like stiff dummies, the bus pulled up. All the people in the queue piled on. They couldn't get on quickly enough. They wanted to get away from the mad boys and that even madder horse. After four or five minutes, the pause effect wore off. We were able to move. I climbed down off Star's back. Sorry, I said to Sean. I don't know what's going to happen. Sean stared down at me. He looked pale. I think I've just had a bad dream, he said. In the middle of the day, I think I'd better go home. He shook his head and slowly they trotted off. Rats, I said to myself. Everything's going wrong. I'd lost the remote control. Guts Garvey had nicked it and there was nothing I could do about it. I was too scared to go near him in case he put me into reverse again. It felt terrible. I walked home with slow, sad footsteps. When I got home, Dad was mad because the remote control had disappeared. I couldn't tell him what had happened. He'd never believe it. I had to spend most of the weekend pretending to help him look for it. The video wouldn't work without the control. On Monday, it was back to school as usual. Back to wandering around with no one to talk to. As I walked around the schoolyard, my stomach rumbled. I was hungry. Really hungry. I hadn't had anything to eat since tea time on Friday night. The reason for this was simple. This was the day of the great spaghetti pig out. A competition to see who could eat the most spaghetti bolognese in 15 minutes. The grand final was to be held at the school hall. The winner received a free trip to London for two. The entrance money went to a charity. I had a good chance of winning. Even though I was skinny, I could eat a lot when I was hungry. I had won all the heats. My record was 10 bowls of spaghetti bolognese in 15 minutes. Maybe if I won the competition, I'd also win the respect of the kids. I was going to give the tickets to London to mum and dad. If they needed a holiday badly. I didn't see Guts Garvey until just before the competition. He kept out of my sight all day. I knew he was cooking up some scheme, but I didn't know what it was. There were four of us up on the platform. Me, two girls, and Guts Garvey. The hall was packed with kids and teachers. I felt confident but nervous. I knew that I could win. I looked at Guts Garvey and saw he was grinning his head off. Then I saw Rabbit in the front row. His pocket was bulging. Rabbit had something in his pocket. I think I knew what it was. They were up to no good. Guts and Rabbit had something cooked up, and it wasn't spaghetti. Plates of steaming spaghetti bolognese were lined up in front of us. Everything was ready for the starter to say go. 
My empty stomach was in a knot. My mind was spinning. I tried to figure out what they were up to. What if I ate five plates of spaghetti and rabbit put me into reverse? I'd uneat it like the man in the cafe. I'd go backwards and take all of the spaghetti out and put it back on my plate. Oh, my knees started to knock. I decided to go back out of the competition. I couldn't go through with it. Go, yelled Mr. Stepney, the school principal. It was too late. I had to go on. I started shoveling spaghetti into my mouth. There was no time to mix in the meat sauce. I just pushed in the platefuls as they came. One, two, three. The winner would be the one to eat the most plates in 15 minutes. I watched Guts and the others out of the corner of my eye. I was already ahead by two bowls. In, out, in, out. Spaghetti, spaghetti, spaghetti. I was up to seven bowls. Guts had only eaten four and the two girls had only managed two each. I was going to win. Mum and Dad would be pleased. Rabbit was watching us from the front row. I noticed Guts nod to him. Rabbit took something out of his pocket. Oh, I could see it was the remote control. He was going to put me on rewind. I was gone. But no. Rabbit was not pointing the control at me. He pointed it at Guts. What was going on? I soon found out. Guts began eating the spaghetti at enormous speed. Just like a movie on fast forward. His fork went up and down to his mouth so quickly you could hardly see it. He licked like lightning. He swallowed at top speed. Boy did he go. His arms whirled. The spaghetti flew. 10, 11, 12 bowls, 13, 14, 15. He was plates ahead. I didn't have a chance to catch up to Guts, the guzzling gourmet. He fed his face like a whirlwind. It was incredible. In the interval. But it really happened. Rabbit had put Guts on fast forward so that he would eat more plates than me in 15 minutes. It wasn't fair, but there was nothing I could do. The audience cheered and shouted. They thought Guts was fantastic. No one had ever seen anything like it before. He was up to 40 bowls. I'd only eaten 10, and the two girls, 6 each. The siren blew. Guts was the winner. I was second. He'd eaten 40 bowls. No one had ever eaten 40 bowls of spaghetti before. Rabbit hit forward on the control, and Guts stopped eating. Everyone cheered Guts. I just looked at my shoes. I felt ill. It wasn't just from eating 10 plates of spaghetti. I swallowed. Just had to keep it all down. That was one of the rules. You weren't allowed to be sick. If you threw up, you lost the competition. Guts stood up. He looked a bit funny. His face was a green colour. His stomach swelled out over his belt. He started to sway from side to side. Then he opened his mouth. Out it came. A great tumbling surge of spew. Tidal wave of swallowed spaghetti and meat sauce. It flowed down the table and onto the floor. Brown and white lake of sick. Guts staggered and tottered. He lurched to the edge of the stage. He opened his mouth again and let forth another avalanche. The kids in the front row screamed as the putrid waterfall splashed down. All over Rabbit. Rabbit shrieked and sent the remote control spinning into the air. I jumped forward and grabbed it. I shouldn't have done what I did, but I couldn't help myself. I pointed the control at Guts and the river of sick. Then I pressed rewind. After that, Guts wasn't very popular at school, to say the least. But I had lots of friends, and Mum and Dad had a great time in London. And as to what happened to the remote control, well, that's another story.